Tonight's guest has a 35-year history of writing and publishing on outdoor topics, including a trio of books on the subject of trout fishing. His latest title is Vermont Trout Ponds, a personal selection of some of his favorite lakes and ponds from around the state. Tonight, he'll be your tour guide through a number of those locations. So without further ado, we at Phoenix Books are pleased to welcome Peter Shea. You can, you can kill that slide for now. Uh, thanks for coming, family, <laughs> everyone. We really appreciate it. Uh, first of all, to introduce the, the book that I'm going to talk about. Actually, I've got this marked up with, uh, so I know that it's mine. But Vermont Trout Ponds, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it covers 20 trout ponds in the state. Uh, there is directions as to how to get there. There's access maps, and in some cases there's depth charts, and in some cases there's a few stories that go along with the lakes and, and ponds uh, that I've included here. Uh, when I was a kid, I never even fished lakes and ponds. I didn't, I mean, I was just mentioning before that lakes and ponds were a place where you fished with a forked stick, not flies. Uh, but the bug bit me, and there's a certain mystery to fishing those places that can't be beat. And uh, if you're looking for large brook trout, which is my favorite fish, uh, lakes and ponds are where you're going to find them. So I'd like to start off, I'm going to uh, read a selection from the book. And the, the selection I'm going to read is actually a little exceptional. Uh, the, the, title is uh, is, uh, the title is, I'd Turn Back If I Were You. And uh, this is the one place where I really don't tell you how to get there because I'm really not encouraging it. I had a horrible time. <laughs> but I did catch a 10-inch fish. And uh, so I think for you, it's a good place to, to go and visit. And so uh, to give you a little background what preceded this, I have a couple of people here that were actually on that trip, if I recall, Ed and Clem. We were planning uh, an adventure out in Idaho. And I think it was got to be, it was July or August when we were so we did, we need a, uh, a shakedown tour. So we, we got our backpacks and we loaded them up. We were going for a o- single overnight. I think we put 60 pounds or more in there. It's just for ballast for the exercise. And we picked this circuitous route to a pond called Duck Pond. And you could get there rather quickly. As we found out, you could drive there, but we walked you know, a, a four mile route. So we'd have about eight miles over a couple of days to to warm up. And uh, it was the first trip of the year. So we got there, I don't know, it might have been four in the afternoon or so. And it was hotter and hotter to blazes. And we were tired. We're all, we were in our 40s then, so it's like we're not spring chickens. And we arrived, we were pooped. And so that's where I'm going to pick up the thread of, of the story that I'll read to you here. We put our burdens down in the large clearing at the south end of Duck Pond. Our horizon was a nice view of the leeward side of Mount Hoar on the horizon at the far end of the pond. Beautiful. We made camp and cooked a hasty supper on the MSR stoves. We were four whooped puppies. It was pretty close to six o'clock when I strung up my rod and began fishing. With nearly three hours of fishing left, And even with the encouragement of the 10-inch brookie I soon caught and released, I knew I was not going to make the magic fishing hour. An early crash and up with the birds, now that sounded like a plan. I was not at all alone in these ruminations. Indeed, I was the only one who had bothered to put a rod together. It was not yet 7 o'clock when open talk began about hitting the sack. In In minutes, we were getting things in order in order to head for the bags. We were as wiped a bevy of sedentary 40-somethings as you could imagine. Suddenly we heard what sounded like a lawnmower bawling in the distance. The sound grew louder, and then in an instant a beat-up VW Beetle sped into camp. With a hundred feet or more of clearing to select from, it parked abruptly 15 feet from one of our pitched tents. It immediately disgorged two campers Leon and Roy. In an era where tattoos were not nearly so common, they had prominent ones. Skulls, blood dripping daggers, old girlfriends' names that had uh, resisted eradication. 
they were congenial enough, they immediately came up and introduced themselves to check us out. They assured us personally they had fished out the pond last May, warned us about the bears, and offered detailed directions on how we might drive our cars in the next time we came. They then proceeded to break into one of two cases of beer they had brought along, offering us a six-pack with genuine hospitality. We politely declined. Our thoughts about immediately bedding down had evaporated. Even if we could have overcome the embarrassment of going to bed at 7 o'clock on a sunny July evening, the incessant banter and arguing in which the two were constantly engaged would have made sleep impossible. They argued about everything. How to pitch the tarp, where to build the fire, who owed money for beer and gas, and where's the best place to lay a bullet into a charging bear, and so on. When all was said and done, they pitched their tarp right off the VW, extending their territorial claim to within eight feet of our area. We found this especially remarkable because the clearing was very large and offered several alternate sites. Though all of this was characterized by a completely affable demeanor, it was more disconcerting than flattering. Moments before, we were blissfully tired, ready for bed, and being serenaded by a chorus of thrush in a spectacular natural setting. The transformation was as profound and instantaneous as switching channels on TV. Well, that's enough of PBS nature. Let's watch the movie on Channel 11, Freddy Krueger and his minion go camping. <laughs> then the surreality absolutely blossomed as they began to build their fire. They made a beeline for an abandoned culvert and proceeded to break off two and three inch thick, thick slabs of this obsidian-like tar coating. In a very short time, they had massed, amassed 50 pounds of this stuff. They then threw about 40 pounds of it into a hastily scraped fire ring, added a couple of pieces of wood as a garnish, and set the thick mass ablaze. The resulting fire was an eerie replica of the Gulf War fires. <laughs> The thick black smoke billowed skyward as they broke out a gaggle of chicken parts and laid them on a grill they had taken along for the task. <laughs> you remember that. <laughs> Leon, the barbecue master, barked directions to Roy as to how to precisely position the grill so that the chicken lay in the exact plane where the Halloween orange flames gave birth to dense inky fumes of the tar smoke. The four of us exchanged glances furtively and near bit our lips bloody. The generosity of these two tattooed waifs can hardly be overstressed. No sooner was the chicken warm than it was pulled from the fire. The dish looked very similar to Louisiana blackened cuisine, except these had an attractive rainbow shimmer when they caught the light just right. <laughs> Select pieces of these semi-raw ebony carcasses were offered to us. We declined and by now were appearing to be rather abstemious old farts against these devil may care duo. As Leon and Roy worked through the chicken and beer, the adrenaline that their advent had stirred in us began to wear off. As the twelfth empty can of beer joined the others in the flaming tar pit, I was again realizing just how bush I bushed I was. Glancing at the remaining 36 full cans now amassed in Napoleonic formation at the water's lapping edge, seeing the pile of extra batteries for the boombox radio which had now emerged from the limitless bowels of the VW, I began to think that things could hardly be worse. Quite simply, I was dead wrong. More visitors. With little warning to herald their coming, two pickup trucks pulled into the clearing. They were filled with laughing, drinking, shrieking, frisbee-throwing, bandana-dog-owning students from Linden State College, or so we guessed. The new crowd was co-ed and numbered about a dozen or so. Everybody waved at everybody. Because Leon and Roy were camped right on top of us, the new arrivals certainly thought we were all together and that Leon was our leader because he never gave up barking orders at Roy telling him what to do. The newly arrived troop branched out with the coordination of South American army ants and quickly denuded the entire compound of any downed wood. 
Then out came the axes, hand saws, and even a chainsaw as they continued to amass fuel what was sure to be the mother of all bonfires. As soon as Leon and Roy saw the chainsaw, they became socially ignited. They struck up a conversation with the students and complimented them on their preparedness. Of course, Leon and Roy usually do bring a chainsaw. But when they camp here, and since they knew they would be coming here, they wouldn't need wood because they had the tar pit. The students returned their preparedness compliments by referencing the three dozen beers that were at the ready in the shallow and expressing their own concern that they might have to send one of the trucks back to the store. We were in a state of mental collapse. As we pondered in our respective minds movies of what the evening would hold in store. Was that a conga drum in the back of the truck? Time passed. The college crowd eventually figured out that Leon and Roy were not out with us on a father's and son's fishing trip. Once they had done that, the social fabric of the encampment quickly developed into an us and them. Leon and Roy abandoned the smoldering tar pit and took up seats at the bonfire near some of the co-eds, hoping against hope that somehow the gods of love would favor them with a miracle. As darkness began to gather and the bonfire spewed sparks 20 feet into the air, their talk turned once again to bear. Then the guns came out. The college crowd bragged a 22 carbine, a 410 single shot, and a small 22 revolver. Leon had a 12 gauge with a pistol grip and vented barrel. Roy had an army surplus 45. They were passing these freely around, slapping each other on the backs, brandishing them towards the far edge of the clearing. We were at our physical limits, and the coming of night was all we needed. We gave them a good night wave and headed for the bags. We knew there was going to be a few hours of rowdy drinking, but we felt bushed enough to hope for sleep, noise or no noise. Again, dead wrong. <laughs> Apparently, we had been the parental authority figures in the encampment. So, as soon as we were tucked in and out of sight, the festivities intensified to bacchanalian proportions. Over the next hour or so, to a musical score of ear-splitting heavy metal music, the scene escalated from shotgunning beers to shotgunning shotguns. If ever there were a bevy of accidents waiting to happen, this assemblage was it. Here they were, shithouse drunk, passing around loaded guns, swooing additional mass quantities of beer, and shooting off rounds toward the other side of the lake. Were there any bear? sneaking up on the bonfire from that end of the lake, they were put on notice by the hail of gunfire that Leon and company was putting out in their direction. At each report of the 22, our stomachs cramped with fear. When either the 410 or the 12 gauge went off, we would thrash into the air an inch or two off our sleeping pads, like cardiac patients being jolted with electric paddles. We were literally getting hit in the face by each blast. Our geodesic ten, uh, tents, the domes, were tautly pitched, and their coated ripstop skins produced enough tympanic action to actually blast air into our faces in concert with each round fired. The occurrence of the shots were completely unpredictable. Rapid volleys were followed by interminable minutes of waiting. We just lay there with knotted, knotted stomachs and funny-tasting mouths running bloody movies of one kind or another. Several times, one of us would mutter something about going out there, ripping the guns out of, their, uh, ripping, uh, the guns out of their hands and keeping them all covered while the rest were disarmed. But each time the suggestion was made, it was thought better of and we just cowered low. The waiting was the worst. Kaboom. Around 3 a.m. we fell asleep, only reasonably confident that we would li live to see another day. At seven in the morning, this confidence was badly shaken as Leon and Roy made their departure. These boys were less than half human. A scant four hours ago, drunker than skunks, they had crawled under the tarp and passed out. Now they were up and at them. Still pissed drunk with places to go, people to see, they packed up their gear in less than 15 minutes, hopped in the VW bug and tried to start the car. I sat up just in time to view the process 
through the drawstring, drawstring screening of the tent's window. If I've neglected so far to mention the 10 to 15 degree slope that interposed the scant distance between our tent and the VW, is because until that moment it seemed of little significance. As the VW failed to start, rolling three feet at us in the venture, it became apparent that the bug had no emergency brake. Or worse, Roy was too drunk to notice. There we were, ground zero in the flight path of the VW. Another turn of the key and the car rolled toward us with its starter whining like the banshee. Another four feet in an accelerating ro a roll and Roy hit the brakes and held the car fast. Taking courage in the fact that Leon and Roy were out of ammunition, one of our party yelled out of the tent at them. No sweat, buddy, Leon yelled back. Roy, I'll get the son of a bitch try. Next try. Well, Leon was right. Roy did get it on the next try. He might even had a couple of feet to spare as the engine roared to life, demonstrating consummate and clearly instinctive driving skill. He jammed on the brakes, instantly slammed it in reverse, and surged the car back up the incline, blasting the tent with sand and gravel. The VW disappeared behind a cloud of noxious blue smoke, and along with Leon and Roy was out of our lives. I remember nothing at all about the rest of the trip, but I suppose that we beat it out of there post haste in the morning. You know, I cannot think of another place in Vermont from which I've taken a 10 inch brookie and not paid a return visit. Duck Pond will always remain the exception. If the lure of, the ten inch, of a 10 inch brookie attracts you, find your way, it's jinxed for me. Uh, yeah, and uh, like I said, the, uh, I mean, the, this is an exceptional map, too, in the book, because the other ones are all done rather seriously. This one marks the spot with skull and crossbones and says, hey, they came from here, you come from there. And, uh, actually, there's a valid uh, depth chart, but it's true, I've not been back. Have you guys been back? No, I've not been back either. Uh, it was uh, something that I wouldn't want to repeat, it was really something. Uh, at any rate, uh, that's one of the stories, and I'm happy to share it with you. And I think I just, at this point, probably uh, we'll move to the slideshow and go from uh, talk about some of the pond, other ponds in the book. I have a techno ghillie here <laughs> that is uh, taking care of uh, the technicalities. Thank you, John. He's been well paid. <laughs> uh, I want to give a plug for another book. Uh, this is actually was published in January. It's called Long Trail Trout. Mr. Ansack there on the far right had darker hair at, the, at that point. Could you raise your hand, Ed, so people know who you are? And uh, that's me in the middle. My friend Bruce, uh, who lives in Kalispell now on the right. And the guy behind the camera doesn't have his face in there. Could you raise your hand, Clem, and let people know who you are? So he's our photographer on that trip. This was... Uh, Northernmost Labrador. Next slide, please. Uh, I, there's another uh, trip in the, covered in the book, and uh, this one was a, a neat little thing that we hired a boat out of West Thumb in Yellowstone, and we got a boat ride to as far as you could take a boat uh, onto the, uh, the east side of the lake, and from there we hiked about a 60 mile circuit up to the Bridger Lakes. Actually, you walk out of the park at that point and then up to Mariposa Lake and back along the promontory, that peninsula in the lake there. Some of the worst walking I've ever had in my life was all blow down. Next slide, please, John. This is uh, another trip that we made to the Beartooth Wilderness. Uh, I remember Clem got the biggest golden trout I had ever seen there on a little tiny fly from a small rise. Another slide, please. This is uh, Valentine Lake in the Wind River Range in Wyoming. Uh, we were actually arrested at that lake. <laughs> we had packed in a pack boat, and, uh, but thought we didn't have life preservers. But we were thinking, like, we're in the wilderness. Who's knife life preserver? Well, evidently, life preservers were necessary. So the man in, rode up in, uh, the, man in the red shirt rode up and gave us a $50 ticket. Uh, 
Next slide, please. And that's, uh, this is Northern Labrador, uh, where the photograph was taken. Uh, this little route we did down here, we landed at a no-name lake here. And I guess it was about maybe a 12 mile, uh, nine to, nine, between nine and 12 miles. We did a circuit down and camped at the Kermatrovic Lakes. We were there about two weeks. Hit a hurricane, high adventure truly. Next slide, please. All right, we'll come to trout ponds. Uh, I'm going to mention this because I don't know how, it was 1981, Ed Ansick and I had a discussion that led to an interesting, that led to everything that's followed. Uh, we were starting talking about, we were both studying geography, we were at the University of Vermont in grad school, and we're both fishing and we just said, well, which, which is the last pond in the state to go out of ice? And so that simple question led us on a quest where we began a research project and ultimately we put out the Atlas of Vermont Trout Ponds. And so this is the pond that actually was the answer to that question. This is it's Sterling Pond. It's a seven acre, uh, let's see, a seven acre pond and it's just above 3,000 feet. So it indeed is the, the last trout pond in, in, in the state to hold its ice. And so uh, another slide, John. Uh, there's another view, it's beautiful uh, place there. There's my buddy Paul Zukowski is fishing there. Another slide, please. Uh, there's Paul in the morning. Uh, I caught 30 trout on that trip. And uh, Paul, who knows what he's doing, caught about 70. And it's just a marvelous place. I, didn't, we, I think maybe the largest he caught me would have been 10 inches. It seems like a monster when you get a 10 incher out of there for sure. But it's just wonderful. Uh, it's a, a very steep walk, it's a climb, you drive up to the notch and then uh, basically you're taking, uh, I think it's the long trail south where you have to, uh, no actually you join the long trail, but there's a, a route that comes up from the, uh, from the notch where you have to climb about a thousand feet. Very steep, uh, I wouldn't recommend you know, closing the night out there and walking out even with a headlamp, it's pretty rough walking. So, you know, if you're going to go up there, the best way to do it, if you're going to fish at night, is stay over. There's a little, uh, there's a cabin there run by the uh, Green Mountain Club you can stay at. Wonderful fishing. Uh, next slide. This is Holland Pond. Uh, one of my favorite places to fish. Uh, this is at an elevation of 1,436 feet and it is 325 acres. It's about two miles north to south, about a half a mile across, and it's a wonderful place to catch rainbows on hex. And the hex hatch there, rule of thumb, July 4th. Very, uh, and they're, they're very nice rainbows. We've had, uh, the last couple of years, haven't had quite as much luck as had in previous years, uh, but it's, it's a great spot. One of the things about the hex hatch there is that some places, uh, there's another pond I'll show you later, uh, Seon Pond in central Vermont. I mean, the hex hatch there might last two or three days and bang, it's gone. Right here, I mean, it goes for a month or more, so it's, a, it's really a, a long-term thing that you can, you can count on like from July through August. Uh, I remember I had Steve, you're, and you were there, Jackson. We, uh, I had one fly on all week long. <laughs> is my hex and I didn't have to use another fly and every night we went out and we caught three or four nice rainbows like this brought them, some of them back to eat but it was so great that uh, I spent an entire week fishing with one fly <laughs> it was wonderful another slide John please that's another uh, view of the pond uh, it's a it's, it's really a great place to say it, this uh, this side of the pond over here that you can't see has got some development on it, some camps, but the entire other side from there for a dozen miles to hit Route 114 is all wilderness. Another slide, please. I put this on to show you my sense of fashion. <laughs> uh, and also to show you this, this thing that you see right there, there's a little white thing on the back of my hand. Next slide, please. That's what's buried in the back of my hand. <laughs> I got a, got a hex stuck there. This is my hex pattern. When I published uh, in the Company of Trout 15 years ago, I had no name for it. 
I called it the fork tailed hex. Uh, I do, it's got a major fork tail, a really oversized wing, and the thing just sits on the water like a little catamaran. And uh, I've, renamed it, uh, I've renamed it the Mansfield Hex. And now that I've misdirected all of you, I want to tell you it's not named after Mount Mansfield, but it's named after Jane Mansfield. <laughs> and it's a reference to my good buddy, who I'll identify as J.H., uh, gave it a little more salacious name, so I've toned it down uh, by referring it to as the, the Mansfield Hex. Next slide, please. This is another view. It's a great Turtle Cove. Is, uh, is, we're looking at Turtle Cove, which is a nice little hot spot on that pond. Another slide, please, John. A frosty morning start. And another slide, please. Last day of the season. <laughs> uh, we got hit with it there, boy. Uh, it was very cold, very wet. And another slide, please. Uh, but we were snug as bugs and rugs, and uh, I can't. Re I don't think we did much fishing uh, successfully there. We did some fishing. Clem, I think you were with me on that trip. Another slide, please. Yeah, this is the last day of the season, and it, you kind of know it's time to quit. <laughs> Another one, please. Well, if you ever bring your buddy out to Vermont from Montana, pass up on the fishing. <laughs> I had my friend out here for a week, and I never had tougher fishing <laughs> in my entire life. He was not impressed with Vermont, although he, he's been here, you know, he hails from here, has been in Montana now for the last uh, 20 years. And there we are at Seon Lodge. I mean, I think I wanted to put that because the, hey, tent <laughs> in the snow, this is like a living a different way. An an another, uh, this is where you eat at Seon. Very nice food, fresh, local, nice lodge there. It's fly fishing only. They have boats that you can rent. Hex Hatch comes off, probably one of the earliest in the States. It's in May. You need to call to find out because it's, it's like a couple of few days, bang, it's gone. Another slide, please. This is what we were looking at for, <laughs> for about three days. That, uh, uh, we stayed two nights, fished three days. I think Bruce, I think we might have caught two fish, and it's the worst that I, time I've ever had there. Usually the place is pretty good. But once you bring somebody from out of state, they're from Montana, they don't know what good fishing is, you, you bring them here and skunk them for three days. <laughs> Next slide, please. Interesting thing about uh, Seon. There's loons there that have learned to attack your trout. Now, I won't mention the fella's name, but there was two guys that reported this to me, and they, they were saying that it was so funny to hear them. I mean, a little while ago, the, the loon was endangered. This is, this is one angler who wants to club one with his net because he has one on line. They come in, he's bringing them in. They pulled fish right out of the net on him. So there was a birder. Uh, again, I'll refrain from naming him, but he's considered a Vermont authority uh, on the subject. And I told him about the story about the loon. I hadn't observed anything myself at this point. I said a couple of friends told me this. Isn't that interesting? And he denied that it completely that it could have happened. So there I am, a couple weeks later, go to Seon. Sure enough, read the log of a variety of people all complaining about that. So if you go to Seon, the loons there have learned to rely on the fishermen to catch their fish. And it's a, I think it's a fascinating thing, although it's not a lot of fun when they do it. Uh, fortunately, Bruce and I were not harassed at all the few days that we spent there because we didn't get any fish. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a little view. If you went to, this is, we're probably a mile and a half, two miles south of the Canadian border. It's a wonderful fishing camp in Averill. Quimby's. It's a fishing camp. It's been around for a hundred years. Great place to go. Set up. It is on Forest Lake and that's what you're looking at. Kind of, um, we're uh, like basically looking out from the porch of uh, one of the cabins out onto Forest Lake. Forest Lake has brown trout. Uh, they have stock browns in the, the spring. They're thrown in so there's some stockfish there. Uh, 
years ago, uh, they, we took some big browns out of there. My, my techno gilly here uh, is, is the guy that usually catches the biggest fish, and he got a nice 16-inch brown out of there. Uh, good fishing, a lot of, uh, and one of the neat things about it, you can walk to Great Averill Pond from there. Uh, we'll throw another slide, next slide, please. That's, that's what the cabins look like. And they're all named after different flies. This one's called the Silver Doctor. Uh, it's a neat place. Uh, another slide, please. Uh, they're about a half an hour, not even the same, 15 to 20 minute walk from your cabin. You can walk to Great Averill. And this is Great Averill Pond. Some people call it Big Averill Lake, I think. I think we were agreed the official name was Great Averill Pond, according to the Department of Libraries. Uh, probably one of the best places in the state to fish lake trout. And that's what I fish when I'm there. And I fish it from shore. And I fish it by casting flies. And I've caught fish. Nice laker, 18, 20 inch laker on a dry fly. Very fun. You have to hit it in the early part of the year when it's, the water's cold. But just standing on shore and, 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 and casting, it's just a great, great thing to be able to catch Lakers. Uh, and I caught them on flies as small as a number 14. Next slide, please. Uh, another view of the lake. It's just sheer wilderness. You can go 20 miles down there. And basically, there is a, a road that follows, follows a power line and another logging road. But that's all there is for 20 miles down to you hit Route 105 coming out of Island Pond. Another slide, please. There's a, just a, a loon swimming along there. The, the loons there, I don't believe, have learned that trick yet, so you're safe. Uh, next, please. Just a beautiful place. It's an early morning shot. Again, another slide. And again. There's my buddy Clem. He's got something on the line there, and it's not a snag. Another, another shot. There's, he, he's got that on the fly. And uh, the neat thing, I think that probably, I mean, that cl might have closed in uh, yeah, 8 to 20 inches maybe. The neat thing about that fish, and it's, uh, I've done, usually gone there in the spring. This was uh, in the fall. That laker is nice and colored up, isn't it? I don't know. You don't see lakers like, like that. Uh, so it's, it's got some great color to it. And uh, I mean, you can, uh, in, in the spring, and then we got lucky in the fall, it's just a, it's a ball catching these fish from shore. Uh, and we're using either streamers or uh, large nymphs, but sometimes I've caught them on it down to 14s. Next, another slide, please. Ah, one of my favorite places in the world, Caspian Lake. And this is a, a view from a camp that we uh, would stay there. No, not anymore. It's all gone. <laughs> uh, some people here that visited that camp uh, with me, we've done that for a number of years. And it's a great place to stay, deep lake. You can picture it as an hourglass, and each, each part of the lake has is a bowl. And it, it, it goes down to 140 feet on one side and over 100 feet in the, the, the northern bowl. Uh, and, and if you're, uh, the hot spot, at least to my mind, is like the northwest corner of the lake. And uh, the hex come out there. We've had a, a crazy time. I, the first time I was there, I was catching hex. This guy here was probably about six years old. And uh, I was telling him we're catching salmon because I had 4X tippet on and we we're breaking them all off. I, I just couldn't land these things. They were snapping off left and right, get them up to the boat. To see them, completely silver, no, no rainbow mark. And Lyman Hunt was a fellow, fellow that had a camp there. He's, he was an octogenarian at the time, now passed on. I said, no, you weren't catching uh, salmon. Those are, those are Caspian rainbows, and they're really a neat fish. The, the fish that go in there are a strain that's related to the strain that runs out of Willoughby. This is not, these are not migratory. They're landlocked, but it's related to the strain that runs in Willoughby, and they're unbelievable. They're so strong. They run after run, get acrobatic on you, and they're nice fish about that long. Now, I have to tell you, in the last few years, there's been something going on up there that's not good. There, I've been up there a few times, and it's not just anecdotal. There's been some kind of thing affecting the, uh, the, the rainbow population up there to some extent. Uh, I raised a question of it a couple of weeks ago to the commissioner. Interesting. Another slide. 
Ah, here's my big tip for fishing hacks. Actually, I have to say, I didn't invent it. Some guy from central Vermont gave me the tip. Two rods. Have the other one all set up and rigged with your, with your other uh, hex. And so when you get all tangled up, as you will, when you're nervous and the fish are hopping and you can't make your fingers and all of a sudden you're in a ball of knot, you put that rod down and pick up the other one. So if you, get, if you got two rods, that's a great tip for uh, fishing at, at last light when you get all tangled up. Go to the another one, another slide. Beautiful lake. It claimed one of my rods, actually. <laughs> a rainbow pulled it right out of the boat. Uh, next slide. That's one of the rainbows uh, taken off. Uh, that's probably, I don't know, that's probably a 16-inch fish, I think. Another slide, please. Uh, there, there's my Caspian getup, and that's a, 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 you know, I'm not a photographer, and the cameras that we use, it's like, we're not out there to take pictures, they're pretty much snapshots, but these fish are just beautiful, they're all silver. You, you, don't, you wouldn't even know that they were a rainbow if you, you, you look at them. Another slide, please. Uh, oh, this were loaded for bear. That was a trip I made with you, Clem. And uh, this was to Big Mud Pond, which is a wilderness pond <clears throat> that uh, there's no trail into it. We're on a, there's a trail you take for part of the way. Uh, you're hiking towards Griffith Lake, south on the, on the old job trail here. And uh, so we were going up there uh, in, I think it was like the first week of October. Another slide, please. Uh, you know, I put this up there and it's wrong. I, had, I thought it was the, it's actually the Peru Peak Wilderness that's there. Lie Brook is another place I go. But uh, you go into the, you leave that trail and follow the stream that drains from the pond up. There's no trail, there's little game trails, but uh, chances are it's harder to follow them in, easier to follow them out. Uh, great place to fish, caught football trout there. These are brookies about that big and about that high. They look like bass. And those were in the fall, and you know, they fattened up over the summer. In the spring, they were a little thinner, but they're really pretty trout. And it is, when we stayed there at like 9 o'clock in the morning, it was sunny. There was like a pack of coyotes just going nuts, and they weren't more than 200 feet away from us. They hadn't, we hadn't had a fire. They had no idea we were there. It was kind of neat. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a view of the, of the pond. Uh, there are very few places to cast. Uh, I bring my waders in usually and kind of like wade out into the water to find a cat. There is a casting place over here. Uh, usually a nesting goose in the, uh, in the spring will attack you if you get too close to it. Uh, another slide, please. And this is like the sun going down that night. <laughs> and the thing iced over, I swear to God, this was like the 5th of, of October or something like that. And I've never really been cold in a sleeping bag at night. We were that night. We had, must have had single digit <coughs> temperatures. And uh, we were just not prepared for it because we had kind of like, I, I had just like a, with my summer bag and I had my long underwear on in, in the tent. And the next morning we got up and went out to the pond and it was all frozen. I thought, oh, I'll break it out. So I got a rock about the size of a baseball and smack, smack. Can't break the ice. <laughs> Eventually, I had to get a rock about this big. There was that much ice. There was almost an inch of ice on that pond overnight because it had gotten so cold. Next slide, please. Ah, different pond. This is Bourne Pond. Very, very, very pretty pond. And I has this, we're looking at a kind of an island in the middle of it there. Uh, it is about a four-mile hike uh, along a trail uh, and I've, this will say something about, I don't know if my stupidity or honoriness or stubbornness or whatever, but I think I've made six trips into there. Uh, each trip was three days, two nights there, and the first five trips I didn't catch a single fish. <laughs> Finally, but I know that there are 18-inch, 20-inch fish in here. I know that for a fact. They've been measured. 
by Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife in Vermont. And so it was on the, my sixth trip there that uh, I saw a rising fish and uh, threw a little fly out at it and nailed it. It was, it was my personal best in Vermont. It went, went 15 inches. So I was pretty happy. But uh, go there for the wilderness experience and don't count necessarily that you're going to score fish. But if you do, the chances are it's going to be a big one. Another slide. That's, uh, we can, that's Stratton Mountain that we're looking at from, uh, and another slide, please. Lots of wildlife there. It was interesting, one last time uh, these loons were hanging out in front of camp, they get curious about you and they were just like behaving themselves and all of a sudden they gave these panicked calls. Like, what is that all about? And we're looking and they're very close to us and they, obviously they weren't, we weren't doing anything. And just a few moments later, this, an eagle flew over, and they were, they were just attentive to it. Another slide. This is born again. There's another view of that little island out there. Go again, another slide. Uh, we're at a different pond now, and this is canoe camping. No, I don't hump this stuff on my back. <laughs> uh, this is Branch Pond, and it's in the, uh, it's, uh, in the Lybrook Wilderness, or at least... If you walk 60 feet back from the pond, you're in the, wall, in the Lybrook Wilderness. And for a number of years, uh, this was one of the destinations that Paul Zukowski and I used to take Trout Unlimited people that would bid on a trip, a fishing trip, and we'd, we'd slave all for four days, cooking food, playing, not guides necessarily because we fish too, but good fishing there. Another slide, please. There's our setup, uh, another slide. And uh, there I am, there's, you see that, that's a hex out there. Now, this is in the fall, there are no hex hatching, but that fly is good all around. I mean, I've, the east, the east branch of the middleberry, I've killed them in the middle of the summer when nothing, they would hit nothing else, but they would nail that big hex. Uh, really a beautiful place. Uh, next slide, please. This was uh, last fall. I think it was in, in October, and Clem and I went out for a, a foray down there. And I don't know, in my entire backpacking career, which we've done a lot, I don't think there are probably six or seven days total that we've, I've had to spend in the tent. And we hit one of these down there. Another, because it was, uh, this, this is the morning, the weather was good then. Uh, another slide, please. We're, uh, you know, getting all psyched up. We went out fishing. We got about an hour or, or two fishing in it, and the wind kicked up. And it was like 38 degrees. Then I think it might have warmed up to the low or mid-40s. But it, it was a 20-mile-an-hour wind blowing all day. So we couldn't even, couldn't even stay out. So we just huddled in the tents eventually. Caught a couple of fish, but nothing, nothing crazy. Uh, next slide. Uh, oh, I had to show this one. This is my lifetime brookie, period. This is a, an 18-inch rookie that I took. Now, here comes the dirty truth. <laughs> it was in New York State. <laughs> uh, but I did catch it on a dry fly, and it was my hex. So uh, although it was in New York, I still took a lot of satisfaction out of it. Uh, next slide. That's a more typical catch for me. <laughs> and I'm just as happy with that. It doesn't take much to keep me. Another one, please. And there's another typical. That's, that's Seon Pond again, but at better times, and not with my Montana buddy. Uh, that's, uh, that's too bad. And, and on those days where I do get skunked and don't catch a fish, I can always console myself by looking at this. Next slide, please. I, I, a few years ago, I had that done on my, on my right uh, calf. So now I don't have to, uh, I never get skunked. You can always see a trout at any time. And uh, that's pretty much, that's the end, of, end of, the, of the show here. But I'd be happy to entertain, entertain some questions. Anyone, anyone? Somebody wants to see your tattoo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's your question? Can I see your tattoo? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we didn't we just show a picture of it there? Are you not going to see any? 
You're not going to see anything better than that. I will, uh, off camera, we will do this later. I, 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 Ari Tien's here filming. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, with the hex hatch, yeah. uh, you were uh, paneling around. Would you uh, cast the rise or just? Oh, both. Wait? Both. Both. You know, a lot of times we're, we're casting to rise, but you could, uh, I mean, when they're, you don't have to wait long when they're really hatching, uh, you're, you're throwing the rises. But on the other hand, uh, early, you know, a hatch has to start somewhere. So <laughs> if you throw one out there and let it sit every once in a while, it'll pound one up. Even. I love to, exactly. What I do is I really twitch it. Have the, have the thing setting out there, let it set on the water. Give it a little twitch so it sends ripples out around it. And pull it back a little closer and give it a little action. That's uh, like how I like to fish it. Do uh, try to hang around structure at all? all right. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, at this point, when we're talking hex, trout are not hanging around structure. They're in places where there's a muddy bottom. Right. Waiting Likely for. uniform. And out of that muddy bottom, are rising these hex nymphs that are about this long and coming up and hatching. So, and in the hex, in ordinary situations, yeah, trout are going to hang around structure. Here, they're finding the finding the you know it's a muddy bottom part of the lake is the structure that you want to look for when you're looking for hex. Right. And the recipe for the the hex is in the book, right? Uh oh yes. Well, actually, it is in one of my books, not in that one. It's not in the company in the company of trout has. Oh, patterns for five of my favorite flies, okay. including that hex. I think I got that one. Yeah, you'll find it in there. Thank you. Yeah. What's the next book? <laughs> uh, <coughs> I can't say. I don't want to. I don't want to give it away. But I am working on one. I do have an idea. Mystery. It's a. It's a mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery. Trout, 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 trout mystery. mystery. <laughs> trout fiction mystery. <laughs> You're going to uh, update your Vermont uh, trout streams book? Wow. Ed was co-author on that. That's a major piece of work. When, when, that was from 10, 10 or more years ago? That came out in 84, I'm thinking, 1984. Uh, it's been reprinted uh, since then. Uh, Lawton Weber. Uh, offer did up a, a second edition <coughs> that I still still think is out there and available. Uh, it was after I, you know, I was associated with Northern Cartographic. Ed and I started the company, and uh, but now I think that it's probably all defunct. I think Watton has copies of the old one, and I, no, I don't have any plans, immediate plans to do trout streams. Although, never say never. Yeah. You ever uh, troll that great uh, Averill? A little bit. The sink line? No, no. It's like, line. yeah, I've all done. You know, my idea of trolling the fly goes down about that deep. <laughs> uh, I've not, I've not fished Averill like that. Uh, people do though. There's all kinds of people go. Oh, they were downriggers and so on. on that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, your motor I think is helpful on that lake. A good, a good size motor. The electric electric motor on a big boat just gets moved all around, and it's. I mean, I think one time I got caught out there. I think with you, Ed, it's like something whipped up, and boy, waves were threatening the bat, the transom of the uh, of the boat as we were trying to get out of the weather. Uh, so yeah, there's power boats allowed there, and it's, that works. Well, no more questions. Thank you so much for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thank you.